Uh, you can ask me questions. Start off with uh, when I was born, not born, but uh, with the fire. Um, the fire was in 19, I think it was 1953. Uh, that was three and a half years old. <laughs> and I don't know if they have records of this, but uh, my brother was playing with matches. That's how the fire started. So I don't think they ever found out how the fire started. But um, a week before the fire started, my mother took us into the kitchen and we had a gas stove. And she showed us the gas and she said, this is very dangerous, don't play with this because it can hurt you. And so we said, yes, mother. And my mother was strict. And she said, jump, you said, oh, hi, mom. <laughs> but she was very loving and kind, right? And so when, um, my brother found the stick matches he was playing with. There was a staircase under the stairs. And he showed me the matches. I said, well, let's go outside and light them. And he said, no, I'm going in here to light them. So he went in this closet. And our parents had all this stuff stored in this closet, right? Debris stacked up maybe six feet high. And he lit the first match. And when the first match lit, it scared him. And I, I still see the match today. It fell to the floor and it caught something on fire. And he ran out of the closet. I was standing outside and I seen the fire. And he said, I said, Ronnie, let's go outside and hide. Because we weren't hiding from the fire. We were hiding from my mother. Because I was three and a half. He's only four and a half. And uh, so he ran out of the closet around the corner to where the staircase was. And he said, I am going to hide upstairs on the bed. And I said, I'm going upstairs, I'm going outside and hide. And my um, cousin that was babysitting, when the fire started, she ran down the street to get my grandmother because they lived about five or six houses down. The blind day got back, the house was engulfed in flames. So anyway, my little sister Karen, I have pictures of her too. Uh, my little sister Karen was in a crib, sleep, and I remember before Ronnie had got the matches, I remember walking up and kissing her, climbing up the side of the crib and kissing her on the cheek, right? And after he hit the match, he ran out of the closet up the stairs. He went up halfway up the stairs and I said, Ronnie, let's go outside and hide. And he said, no, I'm going upstairs and hide under the bed. And that's where they found him. He was burnt to a crisp. And I went outside and I ran across the street and there was an alley that went between the houses. So... The house, kitty corner from ours, had a bush and a tree there. Why well, I went and hid in there. And I remember watching the house burn, thinking my brother and sister was in there. A fire driver came, and the street was full of people. There was people everywhere. I remember looking, peeking through the weeds and bushes and seeing all the people in the fire department. And they said the fire was so hot, they could see my little sister in there, but they couldn't get at her. So she died in the fire too. And so my mother was on the way home from the hospital with a miscarriage. And uh, the police had pulled her over on the highway and told her, they said, we're sorry, but you had a fire and you lost three children in the fire. Because they thought I was in the house too. And so my aunt told me that when they stopped the car, my mother had got out of the car and she was running across the field screaming, my babies, my babies. And they got her back in the car and brought her back. And I remember, the, I remember watching a police car pull up. I seen the police car pull up in front of the house. It's just right next street over, right? From where we're sitting. And I remember watching the police car pull up and my mother got out of the car. And when I seen my mother, the fear left me. And I walked out and I was just standing there. And I don't know who it was. Somebody screamed. There's Mark! Because they thought I was in the house too, right? My mother come running because she was standing on the middle of the street with my father looking at the house and just tears are running down her face, right? And when she seen me, she came and ran and picked me up. And she squeezed me so hard I thought she's going to break my ribs. 
because she thought I was on fire too. From that point on, after that fire, I was a baby until my sister was born about four years later. Uh, yeah, about four or five years later. Five years later, actually, it was. So I was a baby for a time because Karen was younger than me, and Ronnie, who died in the fire, was the year old. Karen was one and a half years younger than me, and Ronnie was one and a half years older than me. And so um, I was a baby for a long time. My mother dragged me everywhere with her. Even when she went to the bathroom, she dragged me to the bathroom. She wouldn't let me out of her sight. So when my two older brothers, and I'll show you the pictures of them, when they got, after the fire, we got the house, into the house, she told my brothers, don't you let him out of your sight. You take him everywhere you go, you walk him to school and bring him home, because she was afraid to lose me, because I was a, I was, I was daring a little child, right? And so, uh, and what year was this? what's that? What year was this again? Pardon? What year was this again? I can't hear you. What year was this? The fire was either 52 or 53. I'm not sure. I, I think it's, uh, you probably see it on the clips here, those clippings. Um, so after that, um, my mother passed away when I was 10 and a half with uh, toxemia. And uh, I was really close to my mother. So. Talk about rebuilding the house. What's that? Talk about rebuilding the house. Oh yeah, oh yeah, when they when they started to rebuild the house, <laughs> they got pictures of me there when they were building the house there. And there's the house itself, it's the next street over. It was 214 George Street, now it's 273 George Street. Uh, and there's some the workers that work there. My grandfather was a, a carpenter mason. And my uncle Alvin was a carpenter, and my uncle Ralph was a carpenter. My uncle Alvin, the Canadian government has a website of his. Is they maintain McCurdy? his. You probably have it here, Is Alvin it McCurdy. Alvin? Well, that he was married to my dad's sister, and Ralph was married to my uh, dad's other sister. So two brothers married two sisters, right? Uh, okay. <laughs> two McCurdy brothers were two married. So I'm married to all the McCurdys too. Mm -hmm. So uh, where was I? Well, building a house. So, oh, well, building a house. So I remember after they built this house. When we first went in it, I remember seeing in the kitchen because people were doting stuff, right? And, and all the, like I said, my grandfather was a, a carpenter and a mason. My uncles were carpenters. My father was a mason. So they knew all the tradesmen. So the tradesmen came and then sit and people donated all the material and they came and built the house for free, right? Wow. So my parents owned the property, but the house we got because everybody donated and built. So after they built the house, when we first moved in it, well, I'll back up a bit. Oh, yeah, when we first moved into it, I remember standing there with my mother and my older sister, looking at all the food on the table, because I'm only three and a half, right, like this, and all my tippy toes and all this food. I said, where did all that food come from? And they said, well, the people donated. So <laughs> so after my, anyway, after my mother passed away, what was I going to say? After my mother passed away, Uh, I went to live with my dad's sister. Yeah. Now that's his book, Lyle Talbot. Uh, that's his, my that dad's sister's family? husband, Lyle Talbot. Is that the, the, yeah, that's his activist? book. Yeah. So I lived with them, which her name was Marietta, my dad's sister. And I got pictures of my other two father's sisters that you don't know. They're not even on the website, which is Isabel and Violet. Okay. So I have pictures of them. Right. So, um, you said you were very close to your mother? Yes, I was very close to my Oh, and after my mother passed away, they both, my mother was a really good Christian, went to the uh, Baptist church in Amherstburg, uh, uh, George Street, down the street, right? And she used to take me down all the time to Sunday school, and after she passed away, uh, I remember going down to my grandparents' house, because they were standing down there until they built the house. And I remember the day she passed away, my father said to me, Mother, your mark's gone. And I remember crying and crying and crying. The house is still there, too, my grandfather's house, grandparents' house. I remember crying and crying and crying when I lost my mother, because I was very close to my mother. Mm -hmm. And uh, from that time and for a year after, I slept with my father, because I was only still little, right? I was only 10, 10 and a half at the time. And... Uh, he would get me on my knees every day 
and say my prayers in the American Monastery prayer so we get on our knees and say our prayers before we went to bed. And then he passed away in 1970, uh, I think it was 1973, just before the Edmund Fitzgerald sank in 74 or 76. And so um, that's one time I almost died in the fire. I almost got run over by the Edmund Fitzgerald. I swam across the bobble with a boy named Bobby Dazio. My father was still alive then. I came down to see my dad. And your parents' names. Pardon? For, for the recording, do you mind just saying your parents' names? You so mind what? Your parents' names. My parents' name? Yeah. My mother's name was Wanda. Her maiden name was Davis. And that, that book is her father's uh, information about her father, who was a. I actually, I got pictures of his. Uh, he was a first Marine engineer for the Canadian Railroad. And my father and grandfather both worked on car ferries. They used to have car fares that go across the Detroit, they put uh, train cars on it, right? And one of the things are still there. There's a, on a if you go down to Lit Avenue and look east, you'll see that thing that used to lift the boat up. So the train, well, it's still they still have one there. There used to be two there. And another one for them, but they're all gone now. But my both, uh, my father and grandfather worked on the on the uh, car ferries. My grandfather was a marine fireman, engineer, and my father was a marine fireman. That mean doesn't mean he started fires. He fired up the boilers. <laughs> so he fired up the boilers. And my grandfather was the one the engineer that took care of the boilers on the bottom of these boats. And their names. What's that? Their names. My father was Herman Wilson, and my grandfather was Hugh Davis. And, and the guy, I think he's still alive. He still lives in town. I wonder if you remember this. Uh, one day I came down to see my father before this boat sank. I think it was 1974, and I think that sank in 76. I'm not sure. Maybe Ed, 70. Edmund Fitzgerald. What's that? Edmund Fitzgerald. Yeah, Edmund Fitzgerald. The, the boy that swam across with me, was his name was Bobby Dazio. I think he still lives in town. And uh, I remember coming down, and Bobby was like, four years younger than me. So we used to swim, that other thing, we used to swim across the Pablo all the time and put our clothes in a plastic bag. And the guy that drove the tug, that he shows you the house, yeah. Cliff Thompson, he drove the tug. He knew all of us kids. And my uncle was his, uh, uh, was his son. So he'd always give us a ride back in the tug, <laughs> right? And so uh, we used to swim across the Bobble all the time. So one time when I got older, I wasn't doing the swim for a while. Bobby was still doing it. And he said, Mark, let's swim the Bobble. I said, I came down to see my dad. Oh, come on, just take a few minutes. And okay. And we seen this boat, but didn't know what it was. Way on the lake, it was headed towards Detroit. Detroit uh, headed towards Detroit. I don't know where it's going, but it was headed that way. And we seen it way out in the lake. And we knew how long it took us to swim across, right? But I didn't know I was going to get tired. <laughs> and I started swimming, and Bobby was swimming. He was younger, so he started outpacing me. The Bobby, wait! And he kept going and going, and finally, I seen this boat bearing down on me. And I remember thinking, I don't have time. And I hollered, Bobby, 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 help me, help me. And I was drowning because I was tired, right? I remember going down for the third time, and when I popped up for the third time, my back hit the buoy, and I grabbed a hold of the chain, and that boat passed me. I remember watching the propeller, and it, you know how far it was from here, that wall? That's how close it was to me. I remember holding on to that chain, watching that boat go by, thinking, and I could feel it sucking, right? Because of the, I mean, a lot of suction when those boats go by. Thinking, I could have been in that. I could have been in that. So that's another time. But I worked over Boblo. Uh, I worked over Boblo. I worked oh, on almost every ride over there. Um, and What's I won't that? go into all the rides, but I worked over Boblo. I worked over the time that uh, there's a girl named Treasure Trela. Well, she fell off that boat. Off that, uh, it was called the Wild Mouse. I was walking with Boblo at the time she fell off. So we had a lot of fun over there <laughs> at Boblo Island. So I worked over there and worked on all the rides and ended up working for the labor gang at the end. Work in the back maintenance shop. 
So that's another part of my story. Um, so you worked the games, and pardon? you worked the games, and you worked at as No, I never worked the games. I worked on all the rides. the rides. The rides, and then I worked on the grounds. Exactly. Uh, I worked on the, on the uh, there was a guy that was lived in the back of town named uh, Bobby Hover. He used to fix the dodging cars. So I remember working, that was the last ride I worked on. And uh, we went there a couple of summers ago, and that that building's still there. The dodging car building is still there. Uh, what else? How long did you work on Bobo? A couple of summers. Awesome. I worked at the candy factory in Emmonsburg. I started dumping tomatoes, and, and I ended up as a cook on the third floor. <laughs> so I got moved from job to job to job, and the last job I had was a cook. Cooking the tomatoes. Uh, that was a that was an experience. So it was either Bobolo or the candy factory. I worked back and forth, right, different places. Uh, what else? What was the name of the candy factory? Uh, Elmer's. Elmer's. It was called Elmer's. Uh, Elmer's something. I know it's Elmer's ketchup, right? Elmer's ketchup. It was Elmer's a factory there. Uh, and how old were you when you worked there? Sixteen. 16, 17, 18, working from there to Bobo back and forth. <laughs> we had a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun. Did you uh, work with any of your siblings? What's that? Did you work with any of your siblings? Oh, uh, not at Bobo. No, I think I was the only one who worked over there. Well, my sister worked over there too, my older sister. She's passed away now, but she worked over there. And my older brother worked for the town here in Emmitsburg. What was his name? Pardon? His name? His name was Gordon. Gordon? Yeah, he worked for the town. Uh, he was. Uh, did backhoe and uh, uh, did garden work and stuff for this for the town of Emmonsburg. Uh, he had a, a degree in um, landscaping, mm -hmm. so he worked for the for the town. Right, my father worked for the town too before he passed away. Actually, the, the they got rid of the boats in Windsor, the car ferries, and my father ended up getting the town working for the town. But he, he, I think he died just before he got his seniority or something. Well, he didn't work long. He worked for the town. But uh, and he was only fifty-one when he died. My mother was uh, thirty-two when she died. She died having a baby with toxemia. So uh, she lost a child with a straight and a half. And I remember when they had her funeral. It was at. Uh, it's a. Uh, Heritage Museum now on the corner, right, right across the street where the old town hall used to be. Uh, I remember a asking my aunt when I was standing there where the baby was because she had lost the baby, right? They said they put it on her feet, so the baby's still there. And my brother and sister, Ryan and Karen, uh, they we can't find their grave because the guy that took care of the graveyard, it was Rose Hill Cemetery. Now, I know their graves, were, I know where they're buried, but we can't find their graves. Mm. Used to be a fence there. The guy that took care of the cemetery, um, he passed away with all the knowledge of his head. So the guy that worked after it, it was Charlie Squire. I went to school with Charlie Squire. So I went down there one day and I looked for the records and I bumped into Charlie working there. He said, you work here? He said, yeah. He said, well, I'm looking for the records of my brother and sister and he looked at the records they couldn't find them so they didn't have gravestones or nothing so we don't know where they're buried and when my mother when my mother got buried they had just started using vaults so when my brother and sister are buried there was no vault so we don't have no idea where their grave where their bodies are but they're in that graveyard somewhere um what else sharing about talking about your siblings Oh, my siblings were, uh, well, my oldest brother's name was Gordon. He worked for the town. Uh, my second oldest brother's name is Ralph. He lives in Vancouver, even to this day. Uh, my third oldest sibling was Ronald. He was the one that died in the fire. Uh, my next sibling under me was Karen. She died in the fire. Then I have a sister under her uh, named Kathy and another brother named Blake. And Brent, all still in Windsor. And then one brother lives out west, Ralph. Uh, I have, I had five children. I had one pass away. Uh, he passed away at 36 with uh, complications of uh, uh, diabetes. diabetes. And 
Uh, he was old, seven years old when they diagnosed him. They said he would have lived to be 36, but he made it to 36. And uh, my daughter was an Ethusil Tammy. Uh, me and my wife had went out to dinner and came back home. My older sister was babysitting. And she said they had to rush my daughter, Karen, to the hospital, found out that she had a stroke. She had a, somehow she ended up getting spinal meningitis. It got into her spine. So they shipped her to London and they couldn't do nothing for her. And she's still paralyzed to this day, but that's how she ended up being the Easter Seals Tammy. So uh, I got pictures and stuff of her, a write up of her. Uh, my other brother, Blake, was a dog catcher in Windsor. And then my other two siblings, they were just like everybody else. Um, I didn't even bring the picture of Blake. They got a picture of him in this picture. These are pictures of, this is the boy Ronnie that died in the fire. And that's me. But there's other pictures of us here somewhere. Um, where there's a good picture of him standing up looking at the air. And then I got a picture of the little girl in here somewhere. Uh, laying on the grass and she had uh, red hair. <laughs> There's a lot of red hair in her family, right? On the Irish side of her family. So she had really red hair and uh, she was uh, like one and a half when she passed away. So so more of my history was uh, my uh, boxing career. And I have stuff here with that. I ended up in the Windsor Vault Get a picture you'll see oh, the vault, yes. in the vault. I used to spar with Clarence Talbot, who was a Canadian heavyweight champion. Uh, Jimmy French was a Canadian middleweight champion. Uh, Donnie and Zimmerman was a Canadian bantamweight champion. And we all used to hang around together and spar, right? And Clarence, that's a Clarence Talbot actually, I sparred with him. And then I had, when, after I was boxing, I stopped boxing, I was coached for a couple of years. So I got to meet um, George Foreman. Right, Archie Moore. I had lunch with Emmanuel Stewart, Hilmer Kente, and uh, Tommy Hearns. They are all champions, right? And, you know, uh, if you talk to anybody older and bring up the name um, Emmanuel Stewart, they know who he was. He was the coach of Kronk. Kronk. Uh, in this book that I show you, where they showed me with the Golden Gloves, uh, there they put that in the paper because. Kronk used to beat about everybody. And that year, we got more Golden Gloves champions than Kronk did. So that's why they put that in the Windsor Star, right? That year. So, uh, and in that picture, uh, there's a couple other guys. But I have pictures of Donnie, uh, Don uh, Zimmerman. He was a bantamweight champion. There's a picture in there with him. That's one of these things. I got a picture of him. And my two sons, I turned them the box. And my son went, he won the very first fight, but knocked the guy out in the second round, right? <laughs> my first fight, I knocked the guy out in the first round. So uh, I have a lot of history, my own history of myself. Um, what else, Sherry? How, how, many, how many years did you coach for? How many what? How many years did you coach? I coached for about four years. Four years? Yeah, I coached for about four years. I, I even coached it. I coached a guy named... Um, uh, Kevin Drew from Chatham, he was a, what they call a carded athlete. So he was carded and paid for by the Canadian government. Wherever he went to fight, the government would pay for him. So I was the guy, the coach that dragged him around, or he dragged me around, or the government dragged I don't remember what it was, but uh, that was that was a lot of fun doing that. So uh, like I said, my, my daughter that was crippled ended up being the 1983 Seals Easter Tammy. Uh, that must have been a really exciting moment. It was because we had dinner with Mayor Kishpont. She was the mayor at the time. Uh, we ended up going to the Windsor Racetrack and they did a special with her at the Windsor Racetrack when was there. Uh, then we did the thing with Pat Bone. <laughs> it, was just, it was just something. Maybe talk to. Was that? Maybe speak a little bit further to that with Pat Boone. Well, Pat Boone wasn't there, but I think they did they did a, a video conference with him at CKLW because that's where we were when he was there, right? So we were there at CKLW, and that's where it was. I remember now. We were at CKLW when they brought Pat Boone online, right? So <laughs> uh, 
so lunch? was that? We went to lunch with all my boxes. Yeah, I went to lunch with Emmanuel Stewart and Hilmer Kente and uh, uh, Tommy Hearns. It was a couple others, but I don't remember who they were. That's when I was coaching, right? So the Windsor Boxing Club and the Crock Pots have come. They were good friends of two coaches. My coach's name is Harry Marshall. And they were good friends. So we went over there one day and the Crown Classes came over and had lunch with them. So at the luncheon was Hilmer Kinte, Tommy Hearns, and Emmanuel Stewart. And I said, wow. So I met George Foreman at the Windsor Arena. And when he was at the Windsor Arena, I forget, I think it was Ernie Shearer's that he had an exhibition fight with. So the coaches were allowed to go through the dressing room, right? So I went to Ernie Shavers' dressing room, and that's when I met Archie Moore. He was a Canadian flyweight champion. I think he was a flyweight champion. Uh, not Canadian, but the world flyweight champion, right? I met Archie Moore. I met George Foreman, and I remember George Foreman standing next to him and went to shake his hands, and his hand looked like a baseball mitt. His hands were really big. He was a big guy. He was a big man. <laughs> And the one I always wanted to meet was Muhammad Ali. I never got to meet him. Oh, my, my, okay, my history. My grand, my son's grandson, Cameron, is a fam famous ballet dancer. Oh, wow. Uh, so you can go on uh, YouTube and just bring up Cameron Wilson, and it will show you videos of him dancing. He's danced with a lot of famous people, right? And my son is a professional scuba diver. Just got his license in the... This is Grovenary, this body recovers and stuff, right? Oh, this book was written by my mother's sister. Let's read the title. A so, Look into the Future. Yep. Uh, so, uh, what was that word that said? Uh, all the growing up and stuff in Amherstburg. All oh. The stuff going on. Me and my, co uh, my, my cousin. My cousin, my brother. Name him. Uh, my other first cousin and my other brother. Name him. Huh? Uh, 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 yeah, yeah, I will. I'll get to that. I'll get to that. They used to like catching pigeons. So they all had pigeons, right? Not me. I didn't have. I used to go with them because I. they were all older than me. Uh, my one brother at West is four years older. My other brother is five years older. All these guys were four or five years older than me. And the reason why I was with them, because they had to take me because of my mother. You take him wherever you go. So we used to go around town and... Uh, we used to get into all the farmer's barns and get pigeons, right? We got into the Amherstburg Town Hall. We got into the post office. We used to sneak in there at night and go up in there and catch pigeons, right? No, no post office knew where the echo was, right? That used to be the echo. That was the old post office at one time. We used to get up in there. And uh, we used to get into the Catholic Church. I remember one Sunday we were going to the Catholic Church, me and my cousin, catch some pigeons. And it was Sunday, right? They were having mass, and we went there. We stuck on the crawl on the floor. We climbed up into the up to the belfry where, belfry where the bells were, right? And <laughs> I climbed on one of the bells, and just as I got on the bell, the priest was down there, and he pulled the bell, and it was going back and forth. Right? You probably wonder why it was so hard to pull that day, but it was up. Awesome. <laughs> we were up there inside the church. Uh, catching pigeons, and we stuck on that. They never, we never knew what was in there. We never broke nothing. This one time, on uh, on Sandwich Street, used to, the old town hall used to be on Sandwich Street. It was a police station at one time, right? And they used to have uh, like a wall about this high, and it was glass from there to the ceiling. And the Amherstburg, they had one police officer named George Hanna. Uh, uh, not George Hanna, it was, uh, he was one, he was the police chief, but they had one police officer, his name was uh, Joe Doobie. Joe Doobie was a police officer at the time. He might have a cousin stuck in the back of the police station, because we were going up the top of the town hall to catch some pigeons, right? We crawled on the floor where he couldn't see us. <laughs> and we got up there and we thought, well, we'll just go up there, catch a couple of pigeons and leave. And he wouldn't know we were in there. So we went up in there, we were up there catching pigeons. And my cousin's still alive, he lives out in Harrow. Uh, we were up there catching pigeons just one day, and uh, uh, Joe Doobie was sitting at his desk, he was doing some stuff, and he left and locked the door, right? And we're still up in, in, in we're still up at the top of the town hall catching pigeons. <laughs> we came down and he was gone, and we said, he's gone. The door locked. 
from the outside, but you could unlock it from the inside. So there's no way that we could lock it and close it. So we went out, we left the building, and we thought, he's going to know we were in there. So we left the door cracked open wide enough so he'd know that somebody's in there. So we stood across the street, and, it, and somebody's jar watching to see who he'd do. He came back in about a half hour, 45 minutes, and we were across the street peeking and watching. And he walked up to the door, and he was looking at the police at the door of the, of the police station, and he knew he locked it. And he's looking all around who was in the police station. He never did find out what was us. But now, now you know, he's gone now, so he can't tell. He can't tell the story. We never broke nothing. We never hurt nothing. We just were kept, little kids catching pigeons, right? We all were young at the time. So uh, uh, we had a lot of we had a lot of stories. We did a lot of stuff as kids. We used to ride horses and hunt and uh, swim the bobble. Always from the Bablo. Uh, I had a really good childhood. Uh, like I said, the house that they built for my parents, the house is still there. It's, right now, it's 273 George Street. So you can take a picture. I don't look like now, but I grew up in that house. And I was only three and a half, and the other house caught a fire. I'll never forget that day. Once well, that house burned, and the flames were jumping around inside the front window. They could see my sister, and I think, remember thinking, where are my little brother and sisters in that house? And that's the last I've ever seen them. I can still see, I, I still to this day, when I think about it, I can still see Ronnie standing at the middle of the stairs, looking down at me, saying, I'm going upstairs to hide under the bed. And that's where they found them, it was burnt to a crisp. Uh, she burnt to a crisp, too. They fed so smoke probably killed them first, right? But still, when you're a little kid, and I killed that guilt. For a long time till I got older. And another thing I cared guilt for, just before my mother died, my mother had bought me <laughs> uh, this little toy set. With, uh, it was a little army set and it had this little cannon that shot these little plastic pellets. And her and my dad were going out to do something. And she looked at me because she knew me because I was adventurous and I wanted to know everything, right? A very curious person. I still am. <laughs> she said, Mark, don't you go. I, I was probably a bit 10 at the time because she died six months later. She said, don't you go looking for those toys. So I said, OK. And in the back of the house, there was a, a room on the, uh, on the right side of the house. And in that back room, there was a closet with a door, a trap door that went up into the attic. Well, that's where they hid the toys. Well, I found them. <laughs> <laughs> and I went up there and I brought that train. I didn't touch somebody else's toys. I just brought mine down and I had it up there in the kitchen floor and I was playing with it. And I said to myself, well, I'll put it back before they get home, right? And I forgot about time what little kids do, right? As they do, right? I'm playing with this toy set, shooting these little plastic pellets out of this little cannon and the little soldiers and stuff like that and they walked in the back door <laughs> and my mother looked at me that's the first time I ever got a spanking from my mother I wasn't bad I was just, I was just uh, a, boy. a little boy right and that bothered me till I got older because I could never say I was sorry to her because I had a really good mother she's such a kind-hearted, sweet person, you do anything for anybody. They're always buying clothes for neighborhood kids and stuff. And I could never say that I was sorry for, for that. Breaking her trust, right? I carried that right till I got older. Go ahead. Talk about your dad's nature, too. What? Well, your dad's nature. Oh, my dad was a clown. I got that. He was, he was a clown. My dad had a real clowny nature. My mother was, she was soft, tender, and soft-hearted. And soft-spoken. And very kind, very, uh, you'd never, if you met her, you'd never forget her. You'd never forget her. you never forget my dad either because he was a clown right from the word go. And uh, I have my dad's nature. I have my mother's softness. Uh, my mother was very laid back and quiet. I'm laid back and quiet, but I can clown, <laughs> as you know. <laughs> but I'm la also laid back and quiet. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very patient. My mother had patience like a rock. So I got her patience too. I'm a very patient person. Uh, 
some other things I did as a child. Um, schooling. What? Schooling. Yeah, what What's that? Schooling, employment. Oh, schooling. Uh, oh, yeah. After my mother died, I was an A student. I was an A student, and she was so proud. You always show, her, look at Mark's marks. Look at the marks they would get. And he showed all the report cards and stuff. And when my mother passed away, my marks did a nosedive. I went, from, I went from a straight A student to a failure. So I ended up failing two classes in school after my mother passed away. Um, but when I got older, I got my schooling back and I got two college degrees. So, <laughs> what school did you go to? I went to Amherstburg Public School. Yeah, and uh, I had a lot of friends. Uh, one of my friends was his parents were the curators at the museum, the Fort Malden, right? So he's going there all the time, and I would get a free pass to go in and had dinner with them. And, um, I had a lot of cousins in town. Most of the Wilsons are gone. I think there's only one left, my cousin. My dad's uh, first cousin's son is the only one left in town. All the Wilsons are gone out of town. They're all gone. And his name? Pardon? His name? Pardon? His name, the last cousin? That's uh, the Wilson? Wayne Wilson, he's gone. He was one of the ones we used to He's out in Harrow now. He was one of the ones we catch pigeon with. Sonny McCurdy, which was Alvin's son, he was also one of the ones we catch pigeon with. Uh, the other families in town were the Carter Wilson. His family's gone out of town. Arnold Wilson, the dad's brother, they're gone. Isabel, they're not in history. Isabel and Violet were not there in history, so I got stuff on them. Uh, Isabel lived in town. Violet lived in the States. Uh, my, when my mother passed away, my younger brother went to live with her over in uh, Detroit. Uh, he was the one that became the dog catcher in the winter. Uh, my older brother, I have pictures of him. Uh, he was born in 1944. Just at the time of the war, is winding down the Second World War. Um, I've met a lot of people in my life, famous people. I've been around because of my boxing career, right? Um, you, you mentioned about the, the buildings that used to be certain things. So the Echo Office was the postal office. Yeah, the Apple, they, they used to be the, I don't know if the post office or the Echo, where it was, the building's gone now. It used to be, or is it still there? Uh, the Echo office is in a different location now. I think it's a restaurant. I think the building's still there. It used to be the Echo before that. It was either the town hall or the post office. And there used to be a clock on the front of it. We used to get in there. <laughs> pigeons? <laughs> we used to sneak in there and uh, we'll go up there and catch pigeons. And we used to get into the town hall that was on Sandwich Street. Sandwich and... It's right across the street from the museum now. It used to be a funeral home. It used to be a Sutton's funeral home there. That's where my mother and father were buried in there. And I remember when my mother died, uh, asking my aunt where the baby was. That was in that funeral home. My mother was in the back room. My father, when he died, was in the front. Uh, he died 12 years after her. Uh, but they're all buried around the same area. Uh, my Uncle Alvin and... Aunt Marguerite and Uncle Ralph and his wife and my mother and father are all buried in the same area of the cemetery. Is that Rose Hill? Uh, Rose Hill Cemetery, yeah, they're all buried, they're all buried there. My aunt, my aunt Emma, my grandmother's sister. Now my, my grandmother, my mother's father, my mother's, my father's mother, his last name was McDowell. And she came from uh, Ireland. Her family, her people came from Ireland. And, uh, her sister was crippled, like my daughter. Mm -hmm. And if you ask people, especially the older folks, maybe on George Street, there's some older folks that need to go along and ask people, they remember Emma McDowell. She used to start down at, uh, what's the end of the street, way down here where George Street stops? Richmond? Hmm? Richmond? Richmond, all the way to the Pike Road, 
She'd sweep the sidewalk all by herself every morning when it snowed with one hand. People would wake up in the morning and the street was clean from one side to the other on both sides of the street. Yeah. And well, I remember, remember the minnows and stuff, all that stuff. What's that? You'd catch all the minnows and go selling them with fishermen. Oh, they used to have a, a cold dock along the, uh, the water down there. It's called a cold dock. And they used to park freighters there and drop coal off because people at the time used coal uh, furnaces, right? Coal fire furnaces. And we used to swim down there on the cold dock. That's one of the times I almost drowned. First time I almost drowned. And my mother found out. <laughs> I'll, I'll get into that story. But anyway, we used to cold dock. You know, we'd go down there. And we, after everybody was gone, we'd go get all the tackle and the spiles, right? And there's always Americans down there set the fishing, and we'd sell it back to them. They die, they die, and sell it back. <laughs> we'd sell them back their own tackle, right? <laughs> and we'd sell them worms, we'd pick worms, and sell them worms. So this one time, uh, and he doesn't live down here anymore either. He's in the States. I don't know if he's still alive. His name is Michael Ribbior, but um, I couldn't swim. My mother knew how daring was. And this is the first time she found out I almost drowned. And I almost drowned again after that. I'll tell you the second story. I oh, almost drowned five times. This <laughs> was one of them. Yeah, that was one of them. Uh, what story was that? Oh, the the oh, yeah, okay. Uh, Cliff Thompson, the guy used to live across the street that drove the, the, the CE parks, right? I know, not the park. He drove the gory, the tug. He pulled the tug back and forth with all the cars and stuff like that. He, he pulled the tug. Right next to that is where the CEO parked, where he parked the tug. Right beside that is where he parked the CE parks. The boat used to go back and forth to Bob Loop. Um, one time I was down there with my older brother that lives out west swimming. He was swimming. He was swimming like a fish. And they had a crane that used to go along the edge of the cold dock. We probably got pictures of it somewhere. He was at the top of the crane getting ready to dive off. And I remember looking at all the kids in the water swimming and they were going like this. I thought, that really looks easy. I was only six, right? <laughs> or five. I said, that looks really easy. So I jumped in. I said, oh, you have to go like this. <laughs> I started grounding. And Ralphie screamed and he was too far away to get me. He screamed, my brother's drowned in the Michael Rebiar. Lived the street over for on Brock Street. He was standing right there in the dock. And I was going again, going down for the third time when he grabbed me by the back of the hair, pulled me up, put me around his neck like that, around like that, around my neck like that, and pulled me out of the water. I got caught in a fish hook four times at the bottom of the river, got my finger stuck in a fish hook. Fish for tackle, right? We used to swim out to meet the bobble boats all the time, and the people would wave at me, look at the kids in the water. <laughs> my brother lived in a house on the river, which is called, it was called the Waterworks. Before he lived there, George Hanna, the chief of police, lived in that house. And uh, we used to go swimming down there. That's one place where I got stuck in a fish hook. <laughs> and along the cold dock, there's a little opening in the fence, you could, we used to go back and forth from waterworks to the cold dock. And we used to swim all along there, right? Mm -hmm. But when we were swimming the bottle, we'd jump in at the waterworks because the current's going that way. And so we'd swim towards the lake, right? On an angle. And it would take us about a half hour to get the other side. But this one time, it was taking me longer than a half hour. That's when the admin always ran me over. <laughs> and I remember going by, Looking at the pillar, I looked up at the side of the ship, Edmund Fitzgerald. I said, I'll never forget that boat. Mm -hmm. So that I have a bunch of replica ships at home. I have the, the, the Titanic. It's about that long. I got uh, uh, a gun or a replica of the Bobble, one of the Bobble boats, St. Clair. Actually, they're rebuilding it right now. It's going to be uh, doing tours up and down the river, and moonlight tours. Um, I have a replica of that. Uh, I got a replica of the Bismarck coming. So I click replica ships, right? This was the first one that started me on that. Mm -hmm. I got that one first. And I was looking for this ship for years. 
and I finally found it. I even went uh, where uh, the place where it sank. It sank off the coast of Newfoundland. And, but they have a museum up in Michigan. I went up to that museum to see if I could get a replica. They didn't have one. So I finally found this. My granddaughter found this online. I said, get that boat. I don't care what it costs. I want it. Mm -hmm. So that was the first boat that I collected. But I got a whole bunch of ships at home. And I'm still collecting more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have the... Uh, I had the bounty. Remember the movie Mutiny, Mutiny on the Bounty? I was on that boat that was docked at Detroit uh, one time. It took my son over. Me and him went on the bounty. I ended up buying that boat later. I got a replica of the bounty. I got a replica of the prince, uh, a couple of Spanish galleons. <laughs> you, um, you mentioned that um, you would uh, go back down and get tackled and push experiment. Did you find anything else of value? While you were swimming, swimming to the bottom? You talking about the blue bottom? No. No, oh, Roman, come in on the. Did you said that house? We got the bottles on the porch and we used to go sell them for five cents. Oh, the open. Yeah, milk bottles. Yeah, we, we, the only bad thing I did was we used to sometimes go in people's milk, uh, milk boxes. They had milk boxes in, right? Had milk deliver milk, and we take the milk bottle to catch them for five cents. <laughs> so, did you find anything ever at the bottom of the water? Yeah, I found, uh, I think I found them dying once at the waterworks. It's where a, a George Hanna's house was before my brother, my brother lived in the same house before he died. Uh, and uh, I remember my father. Talking about Vincent Price. You know who Vincent Price was? Yes. You know he lived in Amherst, right? Yes. Oh, you know that, yes. right? <laughs> and I was showing her the house that he lived in. <laughs> yeah. oh, no. that, down at the end of Lair Street. Oh. Yeah. You know that, right, too? I didn't know the location. He, uh, well, he lived on Lair Street, down at the far end. Oh. You know, the big house that's down there. And I remember talking to my aunt about it once, and she said, no. He never lived there. And then the next day, they had him on the Bill Kennedy show. And he said, well, now I was younger. I lived in Amherstburg. And we used to watch the, the lake freighters go up and down the ship. I said, there you go. There's <laughs> and this is her book. And this book here. Uh, What's it titled? Dresden Raceway. This has my grandfather and her brother in it. And my brother used to go. My brother raced horses all the time. I actually were going to go to the cemetery after. I'm going to show his grave. He's got a picture of a a sulky and a, a horse, a, a rider on it, right, on his grave, because he loved racing horses. And him and my, that's not my uncle, uh, him and my yeah. uncle used to race horses all the time, right? And my uncle had, my uncle had in his backyard, in his farm in Dresden, he had a racetrack where he used to race his horses, he used to uh, practice them out there, right? Train them. And my little daughter, my daughter, Danielle, when she was a little girl, Every time I go there, he'd take her out the back and ride her around with a sulky. <laughs> yeah. So that's this book. And uh, uh, we're not talking about books; we're talking about history here. Hmm. But would you would you say that Amherstburg has changed a lot since you lived there? What's that? Like, would you say Amherstburg has changed a lot since you lived there? Amherstburg, what? Changed a lot since you were little. Oh, yeah, it's changed quite a bit. I think the people's changed too. Um, like this little cabin right here, mm -hmm. that was my uncle's house. Yeah. My Uncle Will. Yeah, talk about that. William Wilson, that was his property. And, uh, down the street, in the next block up, my, his brother, Simon Peter, lived down there. And I used to be at his house all the time. So I was at these two uncles. Because them and my grandfather all lived in Amsterdam. All the other ones lived out here on Drummond Road. <laughs> my Uncle Neil. My uncle Dimp, uh, great uncles. Uh, Can you but, talk a bit more about William Wilson? What's that? Can you talk a bit more about William Wilson? William? Yeah. Oh, yes. He. I forget. He had a, a, a he had a son named William, but we I call him Buck. And he had another same son named Billy, and they called him Bear. And he had an older daughter named Miriam, but we never ever seen her much because she lived in the States. But uh, Buck lived on George Street 
about four or five hours down from us, and uh, Billy Bear with his, lived with his father, uh, William. But uh, he he was a, he was a good man. <laughs> he was a good man, um, but he was. He was uh, He was a quiet man, and uh, there used to be this church here. There used to be a house next to it with a la old lady that lived in it, and her name was uh, Janabel. I can't remember her last name, but the boy that she raised was a relative to the Wilson. Somehow I forget, but uh, and then. Uh, next door to my uncle's house that was here was uh, Max Simpson. The, uh, the house there next to Max Simpson was there. I used to be at his house all the time. But my two favorite uncles were my Uncle Cy and my Uncle Will. So I was always at the house. I don't remember doing a lot with Uncle Will here, but being at his house, right? And he had, like I said, he had two sons and a daughter. He had uh, uh, Billy. Billy died young, and he had Buck. I'm not sure of Buck's first name. Uh, and he had a daughter named Miriam. And they're all dead now, anyway. They're all, all, they're all dead. All my father's uh, cousins and all the in-laws. The last one to die was this guy here. Comes from another famous family from Windsor. And he done a lot of history, too. Lyle Talbot. He worked for the Canadian, uh, for the Canadian government. He worked in Ottawa. He uh, worked in the human rights uh, part. And his his wife was my dad's sister, Marietta. So, uh, like I said, my dad had two younger sisters that are not on the museum because they were too young. They weren't born at the time, so you never got there. Mm -hmm. And the, the youngest daughter was Violet. She moved to the States, and the other daughter was Isabel, and she lived in my grandfather's house right up until she died. Oh, no, she moved out of that. She got married again and moved away to uh, on Spring Garden. And then she got in a car accident. It was never right after that she died. That would be my cousin Wayne, the one that we got in all these buildings in Amherstburg, would be her son. <laughs> uh, yeah, i never forget uh, Joe Doobie, though. When we come out of that police station, he was looking. He was looking. He knew he locked that door when he left. The, and we couldn't lock it, right? So we just walked out. And, and went, it was Wayne's idea. He said, let's go across the street and just hide and watch, see what Joe does. <laughs> he was looking. He walked up and around. He, looked, he never, he did never, never find out who it was. But as far as the fire, I don't know if you could check the records, but I don't think they ever found out who started the fire. It was my brother Ronnie. I remember telling my father after that, and he just kept it to himself. And my mother never did find out because I never told I never I never told the story until I got older, right? So my father knew it was Ronnie, but my mother never knew. She went to the grave not knowing how that fire started. And I don't think the town knew how the fire started because I was too afraid to talk, right? And the only other one that knew was Ronnie, and he perished in the fire. But I can still see that match. He lit that match and it flared and it scared him and he dropped it, right? And that stuff caught on fire and that was the end of that. It was under, under, right under the staircase. I can still see that house burning. Like when they were in that fire. I remember a lot from my childhood. I remember being close to my mother, taking me all over. I remember the last Christmas tree she had before she died. She died in 1960. And uh, she's only 32 years old. And the last Christmas tree she had, it was so beautiful. <laughs> I wish I had pictures of it. But she's always decorating her trees. She had these beautiful Christmas trees, right? And so all these people were in my life. Uh, you, you talked about your Uncle Sai. You had good okay, about Uncle Sai. I was really close to Uncle Sai because he really liked me for some reason. I don't know why. And, then he started getting me chopping wood for him and cutting his grass, and they'd take me, uh, bring me down there and call me and come on, spend the night, Mark, and they'd make me sleep over. And his wife, his name was Ella, she'd be cooking pies and 
they'd always have pies just for me when I come over, and I was just a young lad, probably uh, eight, nine, ten. Is that right? And I were there all the time. There's a, a few people that I used to work for around the time town because I never had an allowance from my father. He didn't have to give me allowance because I was always working. as either cutting grass, shoveling snow, cutting wood, digging gardens, or painting or doing something. I worked all around the town. Everybody knew me and they called, hey, go get Mark, he'll do it. <laughs> we also took care of all of his siblings. And What's that? You took care of all your siblings and cooked and everything at home. What's that? When your mom passed away, you were at home. Oh yeah, when my mother passed back. away, uh, my older brother, he couldn't take it. He went out west, and then, and then his, uh, my other older brother went out west, and he and my sister went to the states, and it was just me and my two younger siblings at home, and because the other brother went to live with my dad's sister, so it was just two me and then tiny. So I ended up learning how to cook and clean the house, and I remember my father. <laughs> It was so sad when I think back about it. Um, he uh, really missed his wife. He died 12 years after her. That first year was really, really hard on him. And he would come home from work. And I would have the house clean and have supper on the table. He'd come home and sometimes he'd look at it and say, Mark, I'm not hungry. And I knew what was wrong with him. He'd go in the bedroom, I could hear him in the bedroom weeping and crying, right? I remember he was about 10 years old. And that's only like I nine or 10 years everything. old, uh, 10 years old when this happened. So, um, so I, I did go live with my dead sister for a period of time. Uh, his wife, the guy that wrote this book, uh, Marietta, up in Windsor. They took really good care of me. We went to Marlboro High School. <laughs> uh, they took really good care of me. So, uh, then I came back home with my father and took care of my younger brother and sister. And I would cook, clean house. Right? My, mar my mother was a person that was always in the garden. So I still have that knack today for being in the garden all the time. Actually, two uh, pine trees that are in the back of that house, she planted, they're still there. Uh, she planted another tree, but it took them all those big willow tree. Um, but I remember working in the garden with my mother and she would, uh, Come on, Mark, let's go in the garden. And she was scar. I'll tell you how you got that. <laughs> I'll, tell, I'll tell you how I got that scar right between my eyes. She'd always have me in the garden working with her because I got really close to her. And like I said, she would drag me around, right? Because I was the baby for until my younger sister was born. Um, so <laughs> I'd go back there and I'd pull weeds and she'd give me stuff to plant. And at the back of the house, we had this door and there was a porch that went down and beside the porch was a strip of land a strip of ground I would say it was probably three feet wide by nine feet long right it was right at the side of the house but one day she said Mark that's yours that's your garden you can plant what you want in there so I went out the shovel and I started digging it and my brother that lives out west came along Ralph he said, I want to dig too. I said, no, it's my garden. And I was holding the spade into the shovel. And <laughs> he said, no, I'm taking, I'm digging. So I got mad and I go, then you dig. And I let it go and the shovel hit me right between the eyes. <laughs> well, my mother came out of the house and she flipped. <laughs> she flipped because he was supposed to take care of me, right? And here I got this big hole in my head and I'm bleeding. <laughs> And so there's a house at the end of George Street, uh, not at the end of George Street, the block before George Street, there's a house there. It was a church for a while. That was our doctor's office. His name was Dr. Leonard before it became a church. And before it was a church, there was a foundation there. Somebody had started building something. And that laid there for probably 10 years, just the foundation was weed growing up until the doctor bought it and built this, a doctor's office there. And I remember one day walking around that foundation with uh, one of the Harris boys, Dennis Harris. And I lost my balance and fell off. And I still got the dent in my head, big scar right here in the back of my head where I fell off and hit my head and knocked myself unconscious. The next thing I woke up was in the doctor's office in my mother's arms like this. <laughs> I was I always hurt myself, right? 
<laughs> so she was always near to take care of that boy, watch that boy, give my other brother, older brothers a charge to watch over me because uh, I was always doing something. <laughs> I was always doing something. I was, I, was a, I was a gutsy little kid, right? I never got in trouble. I never fought. But I, just, I wasn't afraid to do anything. I would try it. I'd jump in the river and couldn't swim. Who would do that? <laughs> but a five or six year old that says, oh, that looks easy. You're just going like this, right? They're just flapping their arms, right? I thought, that looks easy. I'll try it. <laughs> Didn't work. But you know, after that, I'll tell you another story, we should, things we used to do. Uh, I was determined to learn how to swim. So they had the lion's pool, right? And it's not there now, it's gone. And uh, I went to the lion's pool and I learned how to swim. And I was in the river all the time after that, swimming the Bobble. <laughs> Something else we used to do, we used to sneak into the lion's pool at night when it was closed. We'd climb over the fence, all those kids. <laughs> we did a lot of things kids do, right? We never broke nothing. They never knew we were in there. We never got in trouble. Like all the bills, they never knew we were in there, except for one building. And again, it was my, my cousin Wayne, uh, my dad's sister's uh Isabel's son, he lives a little hero. The Burner Mon used to be called, um, Ally Company used to be called the Burner Mon at one time. And we used to get in that building all the time. They had this chute where tractors would pull up. They, I don't know what it was, they'd pull something out of the tractors. And we'd climb up the chute, get in that building, and they again catching pigeons. Until this one time, there was soda ash all over the ground. And they found these little kids' footprints in the soda ash. And guess what they did? They sealed that building up. We never got into it again. <laughs> but we were careful not to get into anything. At this one time, we were walking through all this powder that was all over the ground. We found it later with soda ash, right? And we were walking through the powder and <laughs> not knowing that it was deadly to breathe in, right? Uh, but... Uh, after that day, there was me, Wayne, and I think Sonny McCurdy, another one of the McCurdy's, my first cousin, that went in there. And uh, we went back the next weekend and they sealed that building up tight underground because they figured, what's little kids doing in this building, right? How'd they get in there? And they figured we got up that chute. They tied that chute up, you couldn't get in it anymore. <laughs> and they locked the whole building down. <laughs> but we remember going, playing on Texas Road, waiting for the headless horseman, right? You ever heard the stories? We were the down stories. there all the time, right? <laughs> we'd sit down in our cars, and then we'd go to the, on the, uh, out to the, along the water, the lake, what's called peat moss. used to be called peat moss. We'd go to race our cars. And we'd have one guy here, one guy down there, a slot for the cops come along. And we'd screech tires. There were no houses there back then. We were down there racing our cars, screeching tires, and <laughs> uh, there was... Wayne had a, a 19, uh, 66 Chevy Impala with a 427 in it. Morley Stewart had the same car, different color. Uh, I forget what Sonny had. I had a 66 Impala with a 396 in it. We used to go up there racing all the time. There was a guy named Moose Amlin. He's dead now, I think, too. Um, Donnie Beckett. Remember Beckett's store? They were all friends of us. Donnie Beckett were all friends. We used to all race cars up there at the, uh, at the Pete Moss, called Pete Moss, just before the crick. <laughs> we were always doing something as kids. And we were in all the farmer's barns, <laughs> in all the buildings in town, church, with the bell, ring under the bell. That was the highlight. I remember on those bells, and the priest was pulling the bell, and the bells were ringing, and I was going back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> on the church bell. We were in that building a few times, but that one time, was, uh, it was funny because people were having mass, right? And we see all the people, we crawl along the floor into the building and uh, we stuck up where the priest is. As soon as you go inside the building, there's a door there where the ropes are, right? We get up there, we climb up there and got right up in there to the belfry. <laughs> we got a couple of pigeons, but we never got caught. Never got caught. And the, uh, we've been in the quarries all the time, the, the two quarries, right? The Amherst Quarry and uh, the Amherst Quarry was on 
the Pike Road, I think. And the other quarry was, I think it was Allied Chemical Quarry. We were in that one all the time too. They had this big blue pond there. The water was blue, right? And they hit underground streams and this water filled up the quarry with water. And so they quit mining in that one area. We'd be in there swimming all the time, <laughs> skinny dipping, of course. <laughs> but we were, uh, did a lot of stuff when we were kids in Amherstburg. There was a whole bunch of us all together. What about Jerry? Now, was you and Jerry out here? Or you and What's that? Jerry, I mean, when you guys were little. Jerry? Were you guys out here? Or were you in winter? Jerry? Yeah. But Jerry was older when he came back here. Uh, I was here. But in Windsor, I lived with him in Windsor. Okay. Oh, well, he lived down here too. Oh, you guys got a lot. Yeah, he, he he lived down here too, and uh, uh, he is lived. Jerry Talbot. Well, his name's Talbot. His real name is Jerry Wilson, because his mother brother was Wayne, the little guy that <laughs> we went into building. <laughs> when I went into building, the brother was Wayne. Uh, he had a younger brother named Jerry, so Jerry lived down here at my grandparents' house, where Wayne lived with his mother. But uh, uh, I, I don't know the story, but Jerry ended up living with my dad's other sister. And he grew up there, he got his education there, and they took me to live with him after my mother died. And I lived there for a year or two. And then I came back home to be with my dad because I miss my dad. I was close to my dad too. I had a good dad. He was a he was a kind man. He was funny as heck, though. He was a kind man. He was a good man. And uh, but he really loved my mother. He was really heartbroken when my mother passed away. I remember hearing him cry. He beds him all by himself. He came in there weeping. Some days he'd come home and eat, and other days he'd say, "No, Mark, I'm not hungry," and he'd just walk away. He appreciated what he did, though. What's that? He appreciated everything he did. Yeah, yeah, he did, he did, he did. You know, I visited him all the time after, after that, after I got married, to go down there all the time. It's a but, huge responsibility you took on. Yeah, I was uh, like 10 and a half, 11 years old, take care of uh, a younger sibling. One, my, my sister was uh, two years younger than me. And my younger brother, was eight and a half years younger than me. So I took care of them. I raised them. And they, my brother still tells me I was his dad. <laughs> uh, I cooked for him and cleaned and had them help me. Well, I, I had a schedule for them. This is what you do. This is what I'm doing. This is what you're doing. That's what you're doing. And, I, and they did all the cooking, right? Yeah. I did the gardening too after my mother passed away. So uh, I ended up raising my brother, younger brother and sister. And that's how I learned to cook. I'm a really good cook too, right? So I sure could tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> Did you so, find that gardening made you feel closer to your mother? Yeah, gardening, I got close to, I did a lot of things with my mother, just me and her, did a lot of things together. Uh, she had some friends down the street, the Harris's. Uh, uh, actually, Donald Harris just mm -hmm. died here a couple years ago. Well, his wife was a good friend of my mother. And uh, every time he'd see me, oh, you're one of my sons. Because you know, we were his kid's age. Uh, I was his two sons' age, Byron and Dennis. And uh, Dwight, we were all close to age. We always hung around together. And uh, I was always down to Harris's house, Motor Harris. And her and my mother, compete who had the best Christmas tree at Christmas time. They wow. always do the trees up, but I think my mother was always a little outdone. My mother outdid her all the time. I remember the last Christmas at their house, and I remember the last Christmas at my house at my mother's Christmas tree, and it was beautiful. The last tree she had, she had all these angels and the angel hair and all these all these uh, Christmas ornaments that just bring them back now that they had back then, right? She had them all over her tree. <laughs> I'll never forget that. Anyway, that's the one and only time I got a spanking from her. It was just before she passed away. And that bothered me right up until I got up. I could never say, Mother, I was sorry for breaking your heart, breaking your word. But I'm sure she knew. Yeah, she knew. She knew. She knew. And that spanking told me 
Well, she good. knew because you rubbed her feet all the time. You showed her. Oh her yeah, yeah. She used to. Hand. She used to tell me, uh, "Mark, come rub me feet," because she loved her feet rubbed. And never my other brothers and sisters. It was always me, <laughs> and I want to go play and with my friends, like the Harrises, you know, some of my other friends, the Don Chester. Nope, I want you to say rub my feet. Oh, mom. Uh, no, not mom. Mother. We have to call her mother. She's, I'm your mother, you call me mother. Don't you call me ma, don't you call me mom, don't you call me nothing, you call me mother. So we had to call her mother. So, mother, I want to go inside and play with my friends. Oh, Mark, you know what a woman's intuition, right? So that's your mother? Is this your mother you really love and you're close to? Okay, then I always rub her feet. And you know, to this day, I wish I had one more day to rub her feet, one last yeah. time, but I can't. I don't think there's enough books. <laughs> oh. Yeah, but like in this spare time when you got like a little bit older. Uh, I remember we used to, there's a store, it was called Haddish's. I don't know if you ever heard about it. You know, the, the Strashers now, okay. used to be Kennedy's car lot. Mm -hmm. Well, before he expanded this way, there was a pathway that went back, back there, and there was uh, um, apple trees. And uh, the apple trees were belonged to not the Haddishes, because he had that store there, a little corner store that he used to go in all the time. But there's another guy there, and he used to chase all the trees. We'd go back there and swing on the trees all the time, <laughs> the apple trees. And there was a uh, uh, right there, there was a big field. That was a field. It was a small bush. There's houses in there now, but there was a small bush there. And we'd go in there and catch snakes all the time. We were in all the creeks. My brothers were in the creeks all the time. My older brother couldn't swim. But you know what he used to do? He'd go to a raft in another creek, jump off the raft, go to the bottom of the raft, and pull snapping tools out by his hands out of the mud. We thought he was crazy, but he never got bit, right? He never got bit. And uh, I remember me and I, this one time, me and Wayne were in the Eilers Creek. It's this small part of the creek that's left, that creek used to go all the way out to the lake at one time. We were over there at that one area that's still left there. But we were on a raft one time, and uh, we were catching turtles. Painted turtles, not snapping turtles. My brother did that. <laughs> this guy was at the top of the hill and shot a shotgun at us. We still don't know to this day why that guy did that. Bang! And there used to be a, a nun's place there, right? Mm -hmm. Do you know that? Mm -hmm. uh, there's an apartment building, but there's a house there. And I think it's got pillars or something in front. That used to be a nunnery there. And our doctor had lived there once after it was a nunnery because he had bought the property and he bought this house down here. But he lived there too. But there was a nunnery there once. And uh, there used to be nuns in that place all the time. I don't remember what it was called, but there was some nuns there. And the nuns used to go out and sit and watch us kids in the creeks. We were in the creeks all the time. And farmers, this one guy had horses there. And uh, we tease the horses, and the horses chase us. We'd run around a tree. It's hard for a horse to turn a tree, right? So we just walk around the tree, walk around the tree, and the horse would chase us. Uh, I think it was Gary Harris. One of the Harris boys got kicked by the horse. <laughs> that was the last time we teased those horses. <laughs> and we were out those on grass all the time in the creeks there and all the way up to the lake in the creeks, up to Amherstburg, not Amherstburg Beach. Oh, Amherstburg Beach. There's a beach here called Amsburg Beach. I don't know about that. Okay, there used to be a beach there. That's when my mother got baptized in Amsburg Beach. I was just a little boy. I can still see that to this day, her getting baptized there. And I have a picture of it somewhere. I'm not here, but I have a picture of her out there being baptized. And, so uh, false submersion yeah. baptism. And uh, there was a concession stand there or something. I'm, I'm fixed old stuff or something. But my brother... And my brother's wife's brother were down there all the time. They, he had a band, right? And the, his brother-in-law used to sing. So we're down on that beach all the time. And, uh, and at night, 
we used to go down to that beach and skinny dip all the kids in town. <laughs> what else did you guys do out here at night? What's that? What else did you guys do out at night here? Oh. Like, where'd you hang around? Oh, this one time at night. Oh, the Harris boys. And, uh, He's not, he lives up in LaSalle now. If I took him told him this story, he'd probably remember. His name was Kenny Pussa. And we'd go around town. And this one house, we had a bottle of ketchup, right? We were in front of this house, and these old folks were sitting on the porch. And Kenny was white. Most of my friends are black. A lot of my friends are black. We poured, ke poured ketchup over Kenny. And it would pretend like we're pounding and pounding. <laughs> Come off the porch because we're calling the police on you. We're calling the police on you. And uh, we all took off. Well, what he had waited. And that? the cops came around, they were circling around, circling around looking for us, so they never did find us. <laughs> what well, was that when you were at night to do? Did you guys hang out in the park or was there other places that? We'd hang out in the park. We'd either. Get in the lion's pool at night, or they had the pool at the Amsburg Park there too. We'd get in that pool at night. And we did a lot of skating at the skate rink at the Amherstburg. They would do a rink at the park at one time with a, with a bunkhouse. And the guy that took care of the, took care of the park, I think his name was Ducky Eiler. He used to fill the park with uh, water and uh, flood it. The guy that, um, the guy that had the tug was Cliff. Across the, street. the guy that ran the CEA Parks, his name was Ever. Ever Thompson, I think. I worked for both of them as a deckhand, plus work on the island, right? Mm. And there was a guy in the town named Bobby Morenci. Have you ever heard the name? He was at one time the president of Queensman. Me and Bobby were deckhands on, on the on tug at the same time. <laughs> and we were good friends after that too, me and Bobby Morency. I drove a motorcycle, but I was never in a gang, but he was uh, president of Queensman. So I think Danny Lacey, another friend of mine, is the president now of the Queensman. At least he was at one time. Uh, there was a few guys uh, that was a president of Queensman, that friends of mine, right? So anyway. When you were in your late teens and your twenties, was there any like, dance halls that you guys would go to? Say it again. When you were in your late teens and twenties, were there dance halls you would go to or oh. clubs? <laughs> yeah. Uh, where was it? Well, we did a lot of dancing at the dance hall, Bobo. That's building still there. And the uh, roller rink is still there. The Dodge and Car is still there. And the Drop is still there. And all of everything is gone. Uh, we used to be at White uh, Sands all the time. Another place we'd skinny dip at night. <laughs> uh, but yeah, right here on the corner, uh, it used to be the old parish hall, right? I know what it is now. Uh, we used to have, I played basketball in there. We had dances in there. And they used to have rummage sales in there all the time. Mm. And my mother would go there all the time to the rummage sales. So that building right here in the corner was called the Parish Hall. It was owned by the Catholic Church, the church that we used to get into and catch pigeons. <laughs> I think it's Lighthouse Church now. Is that? I think it's Lighthouse Church, the church on the corner. Oh, yeah, it's a Lighthouse Church. Yeah, it used to be called the Parish Hall, and it belonged to the Catholic Church at one time, the big church on uh, Brock Street. So, uh, we did a lot of stuff when we were living down here. Uh, what did you find changed the most out here? What's that? Like besides growing and stuff, what changed for you out here the most? What changed down here? The people was different. It's not the same people. Uh, yeah, it grew a lot. Yeah, yeah, it's, gr it's grown a lot and there's a lot of buildings down here. My my adulthood. All right, let's go into that. <laughs> That's my children in Amherstburg. There's more of it. This could be here forever. Um, uh, my adulthood. What did I do as an adult? A boxing, a boxing career. Right. 
and a coaching career. I had more fun coaching than in boxing because mm -hmm. I got to take uh, people and coach them and work with them. And we used to go all in places and bring them fighting. And uh, but the highlight of my career was having lunch with Emmanuel Stewart, Gilmar Kente, and Tommy Hearns. <laughs> that was a highlight. Oh, uh, and meeting George Foreman too. Uh, Archie Moore. Uh, as far as my adult, I ended up going to St. Clair College uh, after my drop school fell out. You said you there. got two degrees. Yeah, I, I went there and I took a uh, uh, welder layout fitter. Oh no, I took the industrial maintenance course first. And I ended up getting hired at Forge as a, as a machine repairman. And in 1983, I got laid off. And I went back to college again. I took the um, later well, uh, Walder Leo Fitter course. And I was just at, at the end of the course, maybe three weeks from graduating. And Forge called me back to work, so I never finished the course. <laughs> uh, but I still had the experience, right? Um, mm -hmm. I went to Amherst High. I went to Amherst High School. I went to Amherstburg Public School. Um, did you guys go to church on the side of What's that? Did you guys go to church all the time when we were younger? And when we were winter? Well, when we were out here, even. Oh, my mother took me to church all the time. She mm -hmm. took me down to the Baptist Church down here. And, uh, the minister's name was Reverend Payne, I think it was. His name was Payne. He was a really nice man. And my mother played the piano for the church. And I played the piano. That's another thing I do. I played piano. Uh, she played the... I'm the only one that took piano lessons after my mother. She was. She wrote songs, too. I wrote a couple songs, too. Uh, she uh, was always taking me to Sunday school. And whenever they have a function, she would be one of the women that would cook, too, right? So she played the piano. And, and the two members I have of that church, the last members I have of that church, three last members I have of that church, with my mother being there after she passed away, my father and my brother, because they were all in that church. They took their bodies there. And uh, they were buried from out of the uh, Sutton's funeral home when it's right across the street from where the old uh, Amherst Town Hall used to be. Uh, Gore. Gore and Sandwich right there. I think you know the museum across the street? Yeah. 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 That's, uh, and across the street used to be the old town hall. And that's where me and my cousin went in there and uh, Joe Doobie was working and we got up in there <laughs> and stuck in the building. As far as my adulthood, um, I had two children that were sick. Um, my oldest son, uh, they diagnosed him with severe diabetes when he was about seven. So he was on two needles a day right up until he died. And guess who gave him the shots? I did. <laughs> right. And then my daughter that's handicapped, uh, she had a stroke. Uh, she was three and a half. Same age I was when the fire happened. She was three and a half. That's really young, Dad. Yeah, she was really young. Uh, no, four, no, sorry, she was four and a half when she had her stroke. And my sister was babysitting, and we came home, me and my wife, and uh, they had taken her to the hospital. Something happened to Karen, and she won't wake up, and found out. we took her to London, and... I remember this nicest doctor, his name was Dr. Hinton, uh, took care of her and said that she had a big blood clot on the side of her head. Caused, that's what the meningitis caused, right? And they don't know how it got into her spine, but it ended up going to her brain. And, uh, she's still paralyzed this day, but she's married now and has a couple grandchildren. Actually, with her, her yesterday and her grandchildren. <laughs> Uh, she's a grandmother. All my kids are grandmothers, grandparents now. Uh, even my oldest son, but he's gone. He's passed away at 36. I uh, remember the day that uh, he passed away. Um, he lived with me before that. He lived with me for three months. And um, 
he said he wanted to get a place with his friend. And I said, well, don't go, son, stay with me. Because I was cooking for him, and he enjoyed that, <laughs> of course. <laughs> and he had a place to stay, and he said, Dad, it's time to get on my own. And I looked at him and said, you know, son, I understand. I won't stop you. But if you ever need me, I'm here. So he left my house, and he was gone for about like three weeks. When his friend called and said the ambulance had came, and no, oh, they no, he called us first, and my son had went into diabetic reaction, right? And he didn't know what that was, his friend, but I knew because that happened to him all the time, and I know how to get him out of it, either uh, give him a shot or give him some orange juice, right? But his friend didn't know, so he went into a coma. And he died there in this apartment with his friend. And that was three weeks after he left me. And I was heartbroken after that for a long time that he had left my house. I wish I could have talked him into staying because he'd probably still be alive today. But it is what it is. And uh, I remember going up there and he called us and said, Kenny's on the floor and he won't wake up. No, he's on the couch. And when Amos came, they laid him on the floor, but he was dead by that time. But we were all there at the time. Uh, they said he died from an uh, incident reaction. So that was that was that. And, um, Sounds like you've been through a lot. So. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know, I'm strong. I'm a strong yeah, person. My mother made me. My mother was very strong, yeah. and she made me. Uh, uh, she knows how strong I am. Right? Yeah, yeah. I have a strong personality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not overbearing or I'm not controlling nobody, but my personality is strong, right? Yeah. And I can almost endure the toughest thing. My mother taught me that, and. Uh, the hardest thing for me growing up was growing up without a mother. Because yeah. I was close to my mother before she died. And I was heartbroken after she died. And it started with the fire. I don't remember much before the fire. Just a little bits and pieces of certain things. But I remember that day. And I remember the day she died. And I remember doing things after with her before she died. Like gardening or competing. I remember decorating a Christmas tree with her all the time. Yeah. It was always me, not the other brother and sister. Mark, come help me. Mark, come and wash my feet. Rub my feet. <laughs> Mark, come and help me to garden. And I, why me? Why? But I never complained. Yeah. I never complained. I never said no. I would I would say, can I go play with my friends first? She's oh, and she give me that mummer sob, right? And I said, oh, okay. And I go rub her feet. You know, I was done. She let me go out. She never stopped me from going out. But <laughs> what was Karen in London for? What? What was Karen in London? Karen was in London for one week. And my older brother was in London for one week. And he had, when he was 42, he had an aneurysm. And uh, that's Gordon, my oldest brother Gordon. He worked for the town. He had an aneurysm. And when he was 42, and uh, they helped him, and it was, he had got by that. And then at 46, he ended up getting another aneurysm. But he didn't, he, was, he felt something wrong with him, he didn't know what to do, so he decided to go to London. And uh, this is what the story was, uh, and whether it was true or not, uh, I can't say. I mean, I can just tell you the story that I heard. And what happened to me? He went to London and uh, he was in a coma. Uh, what happened was the doctors were on the table. Uh, they had him on the table. They opened his head up and they were debating over procedure when the aneurysm broke and it leaked out in his brain, put him in a coma. So he was up there in the hospital for a week in a coma. And before he came back to Windsor, they were going to give him up to die. So his kids had that right, right? I didn't have that right. I just went to see him. I went up, I drove up there every day to see him because me and my brother and my brother were really close. Me and him were really close. Uh, right up to the day he died. Um, so I'd go to the hospital to see him every day in London. And his children, they told, the doctors there told him that they had him on life support. 
right? And they had him on a respirator breathing for him. And they said they couldn't find no brain activity, right? And so they told me that. And me and Gordon were close. We'd always share secrets. And we always said, if something happens to me, I want to know. I want to know. So when he went into that coma, I was, the, the day before he woke up, I went to the hospital to see him. And I was talking to him. A nurse came in and she said, he can't hear you. He's in a coma. We got no brain activity. And I said, well, I'm going to talk to him. And she left the room to come back. She got a little irritated with me because I was talking to my brother. He can't hear you. I looked at her and said, listen, that's my brother. And I'm going to talk to him. I'm going to tell him what he needs to hear. And I don't care if you like it or not. You can stay here or you can leave the room. And she got mad and she left the room. And I kept telling him, Gordon, they're going to take the machines off you and you're going to die. You're going to die today. They're going to let you go. Your children has already given the hospital permission to pull the plug on you, Gordon. If you don't get off, they're coming at a certain time. They're going to let you go. The doctor said that 10 minutes after I walked out of the hospital, he started batting his eyes. Half hour later, his eyes popped open. He came out of a coma, right? But he couldn't talk. So they kept him up there for another week and they shipped him here to IOD hospital, right? And so I went there every day to see him. And I talked to him and talked to him and talked to him, tell him what's going on. And this is just before the Gulf War. I was telling him, hey, America's going to go to war with Iraq, right? <laughs> it's just before the Gulf War when he died in 1991. And I go to the hospital and see him every day. And uh, Where was I going with that story? How he opened his eyes. Oh. oh, I go to the hospital to see him every day and I talk to him. And a couple times I went in and he had the newspaper in front of him. I looked at him and said, can you read that paper? And he didn't shake his head. But he goes, he's talking yet, right? So I pick up the paper and I say, tell me where it says such and such in the paper. And he'd take his finger and he'd fall. I said, you can read that. You can really read that. And he shook his head, yes. So a couple of weeks they come back in and he had a paper sitting on his lap. I walked in the room and he said, put it on the table and I went, I looked at him, hadn't spoke for seven months. So I was like, great. It wasn't a vegetable, but he just laid there. <clears throat> and he could shake his head. I said, did you talk to me? He said, put the newspaper on the table. So I called his children, because his children weren't going to bid him that much. I was. After that, they started seeing the father, right? And so he started talking after that, and he, Maybe, maybe a uh, month and a half or two months after he started talking, uh, one of the nurses that was taking care of him was a very good friend of mine. And um, she said to me, Mark, your brother, but she told me before this, he got really sick. She said, if he's going to make it, the only thing that will stop if he gets an infection in his lungs. So that happened. He had an infection in his lungs. And I went in one day to see him. She said, Mark, your brother's really sick. I said, why? She said, well, he's got pneumonia. So no. He said, oh, what's going to happen? She said, he's going to die. He's losing his life signs are going down, right? And so I called my two sisters, and they didn't believe me at first. She said, listen, your brother's not going to make it through the night. Well, he died that night. They went and seen him, but he got to see him before he died. He died, he, he died that night. But I'm glad that that nurse was a friend of mine because I would never have known that he was going to die that night, right? I got to see him just before he died <laughs> that and night before. Mm -hmm. But you heard him too. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, and my brother West, <laughs> every couple of years I go and visit him. So every time I go there, he takes me and gives me a tour of Vancouver. And they got this uh, monorail that goes all around, right? Old Northern Vancouver and East. And He's got two children out there, and they live in Quit Quitland. Uh, what else? Did they lot with the kids and stuff? And used to come with my kids. Yeah. Oh, my son. 
One is scuba diver. I used to think him and his brother the one that passed away. Me and the three of us would go off all the time. This one time we were up, up, uh, up around uh, um, Saint. The St. Clair area up in the Pickle River, the uh, French River. And he had caught some fish. And there, there's a, a rock incline. No beach, just a rock incline, right? I was in there claiming fish, and I told my old son, I said, watch your brother. And so I was claiming some fish, and I heard my old son, Ken, scream, Dad, don't fill in the water! And the water is so fast there, right? In the French River. He went into the water and I ran over there and I seen him as he went under and went, <gasps> and I stuck my hand in there and I grabbed my right by the scruff of the shirt just in time because I never would have gotten him to ground it. <laughs> you also coached your two boys, Fox. Yeah, I coached my two boys. I told her the, 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 you know, my uh, youngest son. First fight, he won his first fight in a minute and a half. <laughs> I have it on video somewhere, but I'm looking for the video right now. Um, but they, they were they were both pretty good. They were both pretty good. And they had a good coach, too. <laughs> Most of them were bad. So I put a lot of effort, in, more effort in them. And you some, well, you put more effort in your child, right? Well, you put effort in all of them. You want, especially your child, to do a little better than someone else would, because that's your child. <laughs> and uh, actually, he just came back from, he's been diving all over the world, right? He just came back from Ottawa, and there's a, uh, a quarry called the Gabolt Quarry, I think it's called. And that's where he just got his master's uh, diving license. Master divers. He's got his license now. He's a master diver. He was in Fiji not too long ago. He's still all over. Wow. He was in Fiji here, what, last month? Was he in Fiji? Was yeah, it last month he was in Fiji? Long, yeah. He's uh, on his way to the Nile now to go dive in the Nile River. <laughs> so he's dialed. There's like, there's like four of them to go. And there's three of them whose name's Mark. <laughs> <laughs> his name's Mark too, right? Like mine. So. And uh, he's really big and buff, <laughs> but he's a scuba diver, and it's his son that is a famous ballet dancer. Oh, okay. Yeah, and he's in Toronto now, and he's—I just seen a video of him uh, the day before yesterday of him dancing in Toronto. Mm -hmm. Actually, he had a concert uh, thing yesterday. My son was supposed to let me know that he had a. a Concert he was dancing at yesterday, and I wanted to go online so I could watch it. But His granddaughter was a model, too. Huh? Ray was a model. Oh, my granddaughter was a model. My granddaughter. Uh, my daughter's uh, daughter was a model. She's a beautiful girl. I got pictures of her. She's... I think it's my Their house was the family get together, the neighborhood kids came, he was the clown of the neighborhood. Yeah. They used to, on the basement floor, all the kids would come to our house at Christmas and on different occasions. And, and the basement floor, I'd paint all the games. Hopscotch and other, uh -huh. we'd make some games up, they'd play around. Right? Uh -huh. And I had a eight millimeter camera. And I bought the, uh, Movies for them of the Three Stooges, Blue Pecker, uh, Lauren Hardy, and uh, some other movies that I have. And the kids used to come there to watch movies. So we would feed them popcorn and make hamburgers for them. And they'd get in the basement playing, watching movies, and, and playing games. And all the neighborhood kids just come to our house <laughs> when they were little. So I, I love children, right? My father was loved children, and my mother loved children. So I got that from them, both of them. And uh, um, who else? There was another a cousin of my father that lived in Amherstburg. His name was Lawrence Wilson. They lived back here. Uh, Charlie Stewart lived just down the street from them on the same street. Uh, the last time I seen Bob Renzi was just a couple years ago when he, before he died. I went to see him just before he died. He lived somewhere along that. Same street, uh, Park Street, mm -hmm. over on Park Street, back in town. Uh, and it used to be 
a pond back there. Have you ever heard of it? What was it called? It's just called the pond. Oh. <laughs> uh, you know where uh, Thrasher's oh. Auto Sales? Well, that wasn't there there. There was a, a field and a fence on the other side of the field. You go through this small bush and there's a great big pond back there. And all those kids used to go back there and swim all the time and catch fish. They have to fish in a pond. <laughs> So that's another thing we used to do. And, uh, we used to go out of town, and our, gu our guiding factor to find our way back home was that Catholic church. We always looked for that steeple. As long as we could see that, we'd never get lost, right? <laughs> <laughs> we always looked for that Catholic church. Um, yeah, I worked at Bendix before they closed. I worked there for uh, 13 years, and they closed up and moved back to the States. And that's when I went back to school. And to get to college, my first college degree. Uh, Very handy. That's Artsy. It? Oh, he's good at everything. Uh, yeah, I do a lot of art and wood, driftwood. Oh, wow. I got this one piece of driftwood that looks like a dinosaur. It's got like a mother dinosaur, and it's got a little baby dinosaur, and a serpent that's going in between them. It's all driftwood. Did he carve it? Or did he no, it? you find it like that. Find it like that, you mount it in a certain way, and that's what it looks like. <laughs> I just, you have a lot of hobbies. Huh? You have a lot of hobbies. I do. Well, you did the woodworking for me with the airplane. You can fix anything. Oh, yeah, yeah. Make Cook some, anything. Yeah. You know, you took the mirrors and stuff. And, yeah, it's not so much now, but I used to do a lot of My man? <laughs> I used okay. to fish wash machine and fridges for people. and. I was, I was always handy, because uh, I worked with a lot, like when I worked with uh, at Bendix and at Forge, I worked with a lot of skilled tradesmen, right? So, so you learned from I learned a lot of tricks from those guys, good friends of mine. Actually, one of the guys lives on, still working at Forge, uh, electrician, lives around the corner from me. And my baby sister lives around the corner from me. So I have two siblings that are dead. I have a, my older sister's dead and my oldest brother's dead. Um, I've officiated at a few funerals, <laughs> believe it or not. Baptisms? Uh, I've, I've done a few baptisms. I'll be doing one here next month. Okay. <laughs> um, what else did I do? You mentioned those baptisms, the Pulse of Virgin baptism with your mother. Was that it? I've heard that's a pretty common thing that happened in this area. Did you witness a lot of that? Back then, yeah, I was, everybody got baptized, water baptized. So you see, Emsburg Beach was a popular place to water baptize, right? And the Baptist Church down here in George Street, that's where they used to take their people to baptize them. And I have a picture of my mother there somewhere getting baptized in that Emsburg Beach. Mm -hmm. The beach is gone now. It's all eroded away. It's all gone now. And my brother used to go there with his uh, brother in law, and he used to have a uh, a band on the beach all the time. <laughs> and that was a long time ago. That's a long time ago. There was a lot of things around Amherstburg when I was coming up that we had fun doing, but a lot of stuff has disappeared. A lot of the old buildings are gone. The buildings that we used to get in gone. The church is still there, of course. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, we weren't mischievous. We just like pigeons, I guess. <laughs> and I was always hanging around the older boys. We used to go down the river and net fish. I remember one time we were going to, we used to call it the McQueen uh, Marina one time. I, I don't know what it is now. I think it's a Coast Guard there now, but it used to be called McQueen Marine. And the uh, you know, United States, uh, I forget. It was part of the United States Army at a uh, Olds Park there. It was uh, two ships, two tugs they had there. One was called the Amherstburg and the other was called, I think it was the Wintonic. Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I've heard of One of the tugs was called the Amherstburg and the other one was called the, I think it was the Wintonic. And they were big tugs. Anyway, they McQueen and Marines used to be there. We used to go down there and sneak in there and net fish. Come home with bucket bowls of perch. <laughs> they did Queen Elizabeth when she was a winter. Oh, wow. Uh, I think that was back in the 80s. 
So you got to meet her then? Or I didn't get to meet her, but I got a video of her driving by her car, and you could see him go by in a car, her and Prince, uh, her and Prince Philip. Mm -hmm. That was back in 1980 something. My kids were little there. Was that a big moment for you and your family when she was here? Um, it was a big, I, was a was big, it a big deal for my kids. Uh -huh. Yeah, they wanted to meet the queen, right? Mm -hmm. That's when they changed uh, Dieppe Gardens to Queen Elizabeth Park. Like that's no, that's that's the time. Yeah, that's the time she came here. I think that's the time she came here. They got a video of her coming to Windsor. She only here for just a day. She did pass through Windsor at one time, <laughs> and uh, what else? Well, you mentioned some items that you brought in as well. You mentioned the, the things that you brought in as well. Okay, yeah, okay. So this book here, this is my mother's uh, uh, sister's son, Bert Jordan. It's titled Motown in Love Lyrics from the book. Motown in Love. Uh, he was a, a probate lawyer in probate court, and he gave up a law practice, and he became a telescope in Motown. So he wrote this book, right? So he's the one that he knew a lot of the singers and stuff. So he wrote this book and he told me about it sometime the people who he's met. Some of that. That's in there. Herb mm -hmm. Jordan. That's this book. This book here is uh, got my grandfather and his brother in it because they were uh, farmer, uh, farmers, uh, farmers in uh, Dresden, right? And that's where my uncle, your great uncle, used to have this. Uh, race horses with my older brother. This is the one that had the racetrack in the back. Her had a racetrack in the back of his house where he used to train his horses. So they were in this book. It's titled Dresden Raceway. This book here. You've seen this book before? Yeah. Where? Um, one of our board directors, uh, Phil Alexander. Oh, Phil. Uh, I know Phil. He um, brought it up in an email. Um, Phil is his nephew. <laughs> yes. So this is, was my. Dad's sister's husband, Lyle. This is the one I lived with when I, after my mother passed away. They were really, they were such nice people. They were really good to me. Mm -hmm. That's that book. That's Memoir of a Black Canadian Yep. Ethics. This book, and my uncle Elvin McCurdy, the Canadian government maintains a website for him because he has a lot of black history on it, right? Yeah. And so I think George McCurdy too, he was my uncle, but he was my, Uncle's brothers. Right? This book here is called The Long Road Home. Uh, it was written by this woman here, Charlotte, Charlotte Bronte Perry. Her husband was a dentist in Windsor, uh, Dr. Dr. Perry. And she wrote this book. And this book has my father and grandfather in it, and a lot of other people that are around the city of Windsor at that time. And it's got pictures of. That's what uh, this picture here is what. Uh, Sandwich Street in Olet Avenue used to look like at <laughs> one time. Yeah. This, book was, this book was written by, it's called The Look Into the Future. This book was written by my mother's sister. She's still alive. She's 90 years old. <laughs> wow. And this book, this book has me in it. I'm in this book. Howard McCurdy, MPs in this book. Uh, George uh, McCurdy's in this book. Ralph, my uncle Ralph's in this book. I'm in the book, and Gordy Dickerson's are all in the same book. <laughs> so from the vault. Yeah, from the vault. Yeah, we're all in that book. And these, what's this? What's this? Did you bring that? Up? His mom wrote a note to the teacher, and he still has oh. it. Oh, wow. Which one that in? One you can you can keep this one. You can keep this one. This is one of the boys I coached. This little guy was a Canadian bantamweight champion. That's me. This here, that's my dad. That's Herman. My mother wrote this when my older brother was eleven years old. And it says, Dear Mr. Adrian, he was the principal at Amherstburg Public School at one time. Uh, Gordon is uh, kept from 
uh, to watch the babies. I, mm -hmm. Something happened. So anyway, she kept them home and wrote the, wrote the principal a note. And I ended up getting it from my aunt that lived in the States. Uh -huh. So I kept that. Yeah. That's my grand, That's her and my grandfather, my dad's mother and father. How many siblings did your mom and dad have? My dad had... It was a big family. Elva was the oldest, then Marguerite. Elva, Marguerite. Arnold, my dad, Isabel, Violet, I'm missing somebody. I think there were seven of them. Uh, my mother had, there was 11 siblings. It was a big family. <laughs> oh, this was my mother's, this is my mother's father, George Richardson. Uh, he lived in Wilshire, Michigan. He was one of the richest men out there. He had a dairy farm and he used to sell dairy and stuff like that. And they did a whole write-up on him. That's, that's him there, my wow. mother's father. Uh, her name was Doraville and his name was George. And uh, it was, uh, their daughter was married to my grandfather who was uh, the Marine engineer for the railroad. Mm -hmm. So the story with that was, he, they grew up, he grew up in, 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 in Dresden. Then he moved to Whitaker, Michigan. And my grandfather went over there to work for him and met my grandmother and married her and came back here. <laughs> so he stayed in Whitaker, Michigan with them. And uh, they had like 24 children. Well, he had four previous and she had, had 21 with her. 21 siblings. Can you believe that? <laughs> That's Michael Herb. He's the one that had the race rat. That's his father. His name was Frank Fort Davis. And her name was uh, Mary Lacey Littleton. <laughs> okay, this, this story is, uh, I, I was probably about eight years old. Not long after I learned how to swim. It was, it was winter time, and right where the C.E. Park used to park, the Gordon Park one spot, and at the foot of uh, name the street, but anyway, the two Amherstburg bubble boats parked. The Amherstburg got park, C.E. Parks, and the, the Gory was a tub. So right where the C.E. Parks parked, we were walking on the ice one winter. <laughs> Me, Glenny Murray, and Brian Sprague. I think there was somebody else there, but I don't remember who it was. I remember those two. I fell through the ice. And the current was dragging me away. And I remember it kicking really, really hard. And I got my hand back up under the, out of the water and was glinting it, grabbed me and, and pulled me out of the water. I was soaking wet. So I was right behind the Lakeview Tavern where across the alley actually from the Lakeview Tavern. We went back there and they built a fire for me. The boys are with it. Because I was afraid to go home because I was soaking wet. And my mother told me to stay away from the river because I almost drowned it, right? So we built this camp, we built this fire back there. We were standing around the fire drying off. And my uncle Alvin McCurdy came out of the back of the Lakeview Motel. And he seen us and he walked over there and this guy had the biggest hands you ever seen in your life, my uncle Alvin. He walked over and said, boy, what you doing? <laughs> and I looked up and Uncle <laughs> Alvin was standing there. With him. And one of the, I think Glenn and Chico said, well, he fell in the river where a little of fire so he could dry off. He said, boy, I'm telling your mother. <laughs> and he went to my mother. And that was the other time I got spanked. The only time I got spanked by my parents was twice by my mother. Once when I broke out of the toys, when you told me to down, at the time when I fell over with those two boys. <laughs> so that's the end of that story. <laughs> this is Lorraine Virgin Lenny uh, recording an interview with Mark Wilson and his friend Sherry, and it's June 20th, 2022.